first thank everybody for coming because everyone, as my friends know, I've been obsessing all day that I was going to get here and two people were going to be here. And one came here because he wanted to sleep and the other one was on the lamb from the law. So <laughs> happy you're here. And I also want to say that I'm so completely thrilled to have Rick Moody here. He's, he's one of my literary heroes. He's just a great guy. He's a fabulous writer and he's a life coach too, which is even cooler. So true. <laughs> so how should we start? Do you want to talk a little about the novel? I'm sort of interested in how you, how, what the genesis is. Okay. Was. I, think, I truly believe that every novel comes, from, at least for me, comes from something that's haunting me. And this particular novel started when I was 17 years old. And it was in the 70s, and I was sitting in study hall behind this girl who was very nice and funny. And, while well, I was telling her about how I was going to go to Paris and be a writer, she was telling me how she was engaged already to a man who was older than she was and it had controlling. And I thought, well, you know, that's what you want to do, that's okay. So a year later I heard the news. She had decided to break up with this guy and he stabbed her 43 times. And I was absolutely haunted and horrified because she was so nice and I kept thinking, why would you stay with somebody for five years? Like, wouldn't you have known that he was violent? And I wanted to write about it, but I didn't know how, not yet. So fast forward 10 years. There I am, two weeks before my wedding, when my fiance wakes up and says, I don't feel so hot, and then collapses with a heart attack and dies. So there I am in a cataclysmic grief, and I took all the money I had and I went around the country talking to psychics and mediums and mediums and any kind of crap book I could find. I finally came home when my money ran out, which was four months. And I decided the only way to stop grieving was to hold myself in a new relationship. My friend said, you've got to be kidding. My mother said, don't you do it. My grief therapist told me that if I did it, he wouldn't see me anymore, but I did it anyway. So I found this boyfriend from the back of New York Magazine. And he seemed perfect because he lived in the future. He lived in the future. He talked about, oh, we're gonna have, we're gonna live in this Upper West Side apartment, which we did. We're gonna go to Europe and we're gonna go backpacking, even though I was a city girl, so I didn't really want to do that. Um, and after about two months of living with him, things started to get weird. Now, I was a hundred pounds then. And we went out to dinner, and I went to reach for a roll, and he took his hand and he put it on mine very gently and said, Honey, you don't really need that roll. You look so much better when you're a little thinner. And I thought, oh, okay. And, you know, I looked on and said, well, maybe he's right. And it got worse. He started to monitor all my food. He wouldn't let me eat. He didn't want me to see my friends, and he didn't want me to see his friends because he was sure that I was flirting with them and I was in a dilemma because I knew if I left him then I'd have to grieve and I didn't want to grieve so I decided it was better to stay with him until one day I went to look at a novel I was writing and I went to look at the last chapter and it was missing and I couldn't find it and instead what was there were a series of Groucho Marx jokes and I turned around and I looked at him, and he said, it's better now, isn't it? And I said, did you, did you go into my work and change it? And he said, yes, of course I did. I'm you, and you're me. And I said, I don't like that. And he said, well, this is the way it's going to be from now on. And that was when I, I thought of my friend in high school, and I realized how you could lose yourself in a relationship and not realize you were being emotionally abused and I was able to leave. So I tried to write the novel again and I still couldn't do it. It was like I couldn't get that narrative drive until a few years ago when I was online I was looking at the clickbait things, you know, like 10 celebrities that had really bad plastic surgery. <laughs> and I happened to see this posting on my husband friend's sister and she was still traumatized by what had happened to her sister all those years ago, and to the point of craziness. And she just was asking people, if you know anything, if you knew my sister, if you know anything at all, please, please tell me, because I'm going nuts. And that's when the story started to coalesce of a sister 
whose younger sister made a really bad decision, and the older sister feels like it's her responsibility to go and sort of make amends. And that's how it all came about. Do you think in those intervening years uh, that there was that there was distance or and or human wisdom that needed to be yeah. acquired in order to get to the material? Yeah, don't you feel that way? I, yeah. I read something about you that said before you wrote Hotels of New York, you were writing another book, correct? Was, yeah. yeah, I was writing a more realistic novel. But I had this experience once I wrote it. I had a grandparent who died of um, Alzheimer's disease, and I wanted to try to write about it. <coughs> and I wrote the story, I must have written it five different ways, and I could never get it to be a great short story. It could only be an ache, you know, right. a howl of grief about what I had seen. And then tw 20 years passed. And then finally, I, the thing unlocked itself. And I, I can't even say how, but I know that it's sort of wisdom right. is required. Right, right. You don't know how. It just sort of creeps up, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, wait a minute. This, this can go here, and this can fit here. And then it sort of spills out. Is there anything about this one for you that, that was logistically different or more complex than yeah. your earlier one? It was really hard to write because there were so many points of view and I didn't know how to connect them together. And plus it was set in the late 60s and the early 70s, so I had to deal with you know, what's true and what isn't true and I had to talk to a lot of people to do research and there were many, many times when I felt I, I lost this book. In fact, when I first handed it in to my editor, Elle Gottman, she said, Caroline, I really love the book, but the tone is all wrong. You <laughs> have to redo it, which happens a lot. And I, I actually was really glad that she said that because there was a lot of anger in the novel that was really on top of the love that I felt for my mother and my sister at an earlier time than now. So it, 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 it germinates, don't you think? Like you, you, you want to start a novel and then it turns into something else? Yeah, I mean, this raises another question that I wanted to ask, and, and uh, that was, did you, who's feeding back? Who or her? <laughs> Rosie? Is there a sound person anywhere? Or just, it's can you just turn bit. it down a tad? Um, uh, did you outline, or did you discover the structure as you went? I do, I do both. I have to have a synopsis so I feel like, okay, it's a novel. I have a beginning, I have a middle, and an end. And then it changes as I write it. And I always, after I do the synopsis, I have to have a good first chapter. And then after I have that, I send it to my incredible agent, Gil Hodge, who's right there. And she advises me, like, well, this doesn't work, or I don't know about this, blah, blah, blah. And she's always right. So then I go back and I rewrite it, and it gets rewritten a bunch of different times. And then when it seems like, okay, it might work, then we send it to my editor, and then the editor says, whatever the editor says. But even when it seems like it's in a form, it changes as I'm writing it, because you discover new things, and you start to find new feelings that come up. Isn't that way for you? Totally. That yeah. One time I wrote this book, the novel after the ice storm, it's called Purple America, and there was a villain, this is, I think, true in your book too, but there was a villain who, for me, I was so excited to write about this villain, because I really hate him. So I was really excited to sort of stick the knife in. Yeah. But the problem was that in the process of writing the book, he started to heroize himself. And he became much more morally accessible right, than exactly. if I just thought of him as a villain. Right, right, because no villain thinks of himself as a villain. He thinks he's doing the right thing. I mean, and that was the, I mean, the, to me, the weirdest thing of all was when I had to write something from the so-called villain's point of view at the end, and where he tells his side of the story. And when I finished it, I felt sorry for him, but then I thought, what if he's not telling the truth? 
And I didn't know it. It was the first time I wrote a book where I thought, is this a reliable narrator? Or I, what's going on here? But I found that part so remarkable. I have to say, we're, what we're doing right now is trying to not give the end away. <laughs> and, um, so there's a bad guy, and then he gets a big section at the end where he gets to tell the story from his point of view. And it's remarkable because you don't yeah, pull yeah. back and say, hey, I think he's an asshole too. You kind of let him take the line and run with it for a while. And as a result, the book is deepened for me and made you. more complex. I think it's really risky and very brilliant. Oh, thank you. That, it was really hard to do because it, it, I get emails from people who say, like, well, what do you think? Like, is he really a good change guy? Or is he the same? idiot he always was, and my answer is, it's the first time, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I really don't know, and I liked that feeling, not knowing what was going on with him. Was that baked in, or did you discover that? I discovered it, I discovered so it. I mean, I was just sort of doing it, I thought, well, he should be able to tell a story. And then he started to talk on the page, and I thought, oh, I'm starting to sort of like him. I mean, he's doing this, he's doing other stuff. And when he comes to his confession, I thought, is he telling the truth or not? And does he think he's telling the truth? Or does he know he's not telling the truth? And I still don't know. And I like that. I want to do more of that. Yeah. I mean, the takeaway yeah, for the reader is don't come to easy conclusions. Look right. for the more complex interpretation right. of this person. Well, that's like your books, too. You do this. <laughs> you do the same. You do the same thing, and um, it's just weird. The way I, I actually wrote down this question I wanted to ask you. It was really important to ask you. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to ask you about your process. That when you're writing something and you have the intent to write something, and then you finish it, and you look at it, and you think, oh my god, that wasn't the book I intended to write, but it still works. Does that happen to you? Every time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that every makes me time. Feel but I sort of feel like my position on that now is I'm happy to give up the one I wanted to write. Yeah. 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 Thus, we actually complete the job in a way, and I'd rather make the book than agonize over a vision. Right. Do you have doubts when you write? Because <laughs> I do. Yeah, so many doubts. Yeah. And so what do you do? Do you just sort of push through them or? I said to a student last week that doubt is vanity. And I think that's kind of right, true. That's true. Like the process. You said to me, Caroline said backstage, I said, congratulations on the book. And she said, it's another book. I really just want to make another one. And yeah. that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I love the process. I love the journey of discovery. Me too. And I don't um, get hung up on uh, you know moments in the process. I just keep pushing forward. Yeah, that's what it is. That's exactly what it is. Should we read a little? You read yeah. some. Okay, yeah. I'm read. Okay, I, it was really hard to figure out something to read because there's so much seeds of what's going on that I didn't want to read the wrong thing because then you know how the book ends. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. So I took something at the beginning of the book, which is how Lucy, who's 16 years old, it's 1969, right before, you know, it's like when Woodstock turns into Altima, so when Peace of Love turns into the Manson people. And she's fallen in love with her 30-year-old teacher who's going to be at, uh, he's going to go to an off-the-grid existence in Pennsylvania to live off the land, which was a really big thing in the 70s. And by the way, everybody I know who did that in the 70s starved. Nobody yeah. had fun. <laughs> they all came back to the city. Although, I just have to say one funny story. My friend James at the University of um, Ann Arbor, when Stephen Gaskin, who created the farm, which is still going today, which is this big, huge bachelor in commune. He came to talk to all the freshmen, and all the freshmen were all freaked out because it was the first time they were away from home. 
And he told them, come with us, live on the farm, it'll be utopia, we'll take care of you. And half the students left to go with him, and they never came back. And the only reason my friend Jane didn't go is because one of the people from the farm had scabies. <laughs> so anyway, this is, this is Lucy meeting Will. She's, she's desperately in love with her high school teacher, and she wants to get together, and she doesn't know how he feels about her. Okay, Lucy walked home crying. Everything was ruined. How could she have been so stupid? What was wrong with her? She was crying so hard she couldn't see in front of her. It was starting to snow. She wiped at her eyes at her running nose. A woman passed her, gave her a strange look, but kept going. Two girls in identical red maxi coats stared at Lucy and then whispered behind their hands. She didn't go to school the next day or the next. Instead, she painted watercolors on a card. Blue stars and moons floating out of a silver cup. It looked impossibly beautiful to her. She thought about signing it, but instead tucked it into an envelope and looked up at William's address on the white pages. Iris was watching the movie on TV. So in rose she didn't hear Lucy slipping out the front door. Lucy hitchhiked to Williams, and as soon as she got to the floor of the apartment, she hit all the buzzers until someone let her in. Then she ran up the stairs and slid the car under his door. By the time she got home, she felt sick. On the third day, she returned to school and walked into William's class. Nice to see you, he said shortly. And then she felt his hand on the back of her back, just for a moment, like an electrical current. Go take a seat, he said, and flushed she did. She sleepwalked through her classes, but the teachers thought she'd been sick, so they gave her leave. At the end of school, as she was about to walk home, she saw William standing by his car, looking at her as if he was waiting for her. He was perfectly still until she was close to him, and then he bent as if he were telling her a secret. Do you think you could get to Belmont today, he said. What? The sun was in her eyes, and she squinted at him. It looked as if he had a halo shimmering around his head. We can't go there together, you and me, he said. He wrote something on a piece of paper and then folded it like origami and handed it to her. She saw his hands were shaking. She opened the paper, 1214 Winston Drive, apartment 4B. It was the same address where she had delivered the card. She nodded and tucked the paper into her hand. I'm suffering too, Lizzie, he said. She found a payphone to call Iris. I'm hanging with friends, she said. I'll be home much later. Then she hitched again, a ride from a woman in a purple snow jacket who talked to her about the dangers of hippies. She was silent the whole time. When they arrived, Lucy practically ran into the apartment building. She walked up the two flights, rang his bell. She could hear music, an itchy slide of jazz. And when she got to William's floor, she smelled coffee. And there he was, standing in the hall in jeans and a white t-shirt, his door open. His hair was long, down to his shoulders, and she thought, how beautiful. He looked away from her, pained. Did you change your mind, she said? Should I go home? Yes, no, come inside. His place was small and bright with sun. There was a big painting of a red dog on the wall. She didn't know what to do, so she waited. Sit, he ordered. We have to talk about this. She moved gingerly to the edge of his nubby white couch, but he kept moving around the room, pacing. You think it's just you and it's not, he said. What's not, Lucy said. I get to school and you're the only person I want to talk to. How insane is that? Me too, she said, but he lifted his hand. Let me finish. All day things happen and I keep thinking, I want to tell Lucy this. I want to show Lucy the article. I wonder what Lucy would think about this piece I heard on the radio. If she likes this song, this dish, this color. I feel like that about you, Lucy said. Don't say that, Lucy said. Please don't say that. This whole situation is ridiculous. All I wanted was to help you get better as a writer, help you shine a little. That's my job as a teacher. You're my student. He dug his hands into his pockets, his face tense and miserable. I can't stop thinking about you, he said. What's wrong with me that I can't stop thinking about you? He shook his head. You don't look 16. You don't act 16. You sent me that card, Lucy. I know it was you. It was the most shockingly beautiful thing I've ever seen. Who knew you could paint? I can't, Lucy said. Not really. I just sort of mess around. No, no. This wasn't messing around. This was truly amazing. It spoke to me. She flushed. 
I have a friend, William said, who met his wife when she was 15 and he was 25. Everyone told them it would never, ever work. He was too old for her. It was just wrong. But they didn't listen. She's 70 now. And he's 80. The age difference means nothing. It's a blink. Can you imagine? We back then, they just knew. They just recognized something in the other. What's age, really? Haven't you seen some impossibly immature adults? Some really wise young people? He finally stopped pacing. You're an old soul, Lucy, he said. You don't think like 16. Well, you don't think like 30, she said, and he laughed. <laughs> How would you know what 30 thinks like, he said. Lucy stood up and moved towards him and kissed his mouth. His lips were soft and warm, and she sighed against them. He pushed her back, but she kissed him again, and then she felt him, kissing her, gently at first, and then harder, and then he was lowering her to the floor as if she were a captive. Thank you. <laughs> speech in Australia oh, with, was a with incredible <laughs> right. uh, avidity. And uh, it bears on what we heard and what I think about this book in the following way. You're awesome at the masculine point of view. Thank you. And, uh, and so this book is what, what the industry insiders refer to as third person limited from rotating points of view, which means, which means it's in a different character's point of view in each chapter. Mm -hmm. And William, about whom you just heard, gets some passages from his point of view, as does uh, one other male character. Patrick. Yeah. And I was wondering, because you're so good at it, uh, how that process works for you and if it's changed over time. It has changed over time. It's very, there's a, I'm sure you know this, there's a moment when you're writing a character and at first they're not alive at all. And you think, what am I doing? I don't know this person. And then all of a sudden it sort of clicks in. And I was really concerned that I wanted, I didn't want any real villains. I wanted there to be some sort of, I wanted William to be trapped. And in a sense he is Trapped, and he's trapped in the late 60s with all this free school baloney. And I don't, I'm not a real big proponent of free schools. Our, our son went to a progressive school and it didn't turn out very well. They were mostly throwing paper airplanes, which was supposed to be mad. Um, but so he's sort of a victim of that. He really wants to do something, he really wants to teach. And I thought, well, that's a good thing about it, and that makes me sort of like him. And I had to dig deeper to find out well, why does he have this need to control? And why is it this young girl? And why is he doing the stuff that he's doing? I mean, in, in terms of the Lionel Shriver thing, I know her vaguely, and she's very opinionated. <laughs> she's very opinionated. And my feeling about art is that if you can write, you can write about anything you want as long as it sounds real and as long as you get into the head of the person and you're not making them a cliche of any sort. I think when you start using the cliches then it is cultural approbation. But if you're making someone who's unique and alive and you believe that they're alive and you know we're all human and we all crave love and attention and everything else, and I think that's sort of the key. But so how do you make that journey? I mean, you say you get into the head of a male character. How do you get into that head? Well, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> what I do is, a friend of mine gave me this book once on any careers. It's really sort of stupid and dull. It's like all the personality types and what personality types are the worst personality types for the... So I look at that and I think, well, I, I knew who Lucy was and I thought, well, what kind of person would be the worst person for a girl like Lucy who wants to feel that she matters and that she's smart? And I thought, well, who 
probably would be somebody who was sort of controlling, who made her, who was older, who made her feel that way. So then I went back to the stupid little Enneagram book, and I looked it up, and there was a personality profile for someone like that. And the more I read it, the more I thought, oh, that could work. I could, I could use that. So I use whatever tricks I can find until it starts to breathe and become its own. It's just, and then there's a point where you feel like you're hallucinating. You're in this other, you're in this other world. We have a joke in my household where Jeff says, "When well, I'm really into the work or if I'm reading something, he could say, Caroline, the house is on fire, and I'm still like writing away. <laughs> it becomes alive. I don't really know how, because if I knew that I could do it much sooner. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever ask Jeff's opinion on how the guys would be treated in the books to make sure you've crossed the teeth I, of the dog? <laughs> I always ask him his opinion. He's not fiction, I'm fiction. So we say he tells the truth and I lie, or I tell the deeper <laughs> truth. I asked him, uh, for this particular book, I asked him a lot about you know, the 60s, I needed to know about like the late 60s and the early 70s. And, what was the big change in like drugs and what was the thing about Manson? Why were people so obsessed with him and why are they obsessed with him now? And just a lot of detail about like what does it feel like and did I get it right? And so he does that stuff. And he he reads the whole manuscript and says, like, This doesn't this isn't computing or whatever else. And, you know, and I have other people who who read too, who uh, Leora does the psychological stuff. <laughs> She's good at that. And then I have other writers who just, you know, do other stuff in terms of the words and stuff. Because I'm never sure. As you put it. Yeah, I'm never sure. <laughs> never um, sure. I wanted to ask about the Manson thing. The Manson women right. are a recurring motif in the book. I'm dying to talk about this. Yeah. I'm, I'm really dying to talk about this. They, um, when I was in college in the 70s, I remember seeing the Manson girls on the air. And they were beautiful. And they were happy. And they were singing. And if you didn't know what they did, you would think, what's going on? And you know, one of the things I talked to Jeff about was, because I was trying to figure out, well, why? What was it about Manson? And Jeff said, well, he looked like a hippie. He looked like 69, but he was really 70 when the violence came. I talked to somebody who lived on near Spawn Ranch who knew the Mansons, and he said, they were like hippies, except not the good kind. They were a little dirtier, but they still talked about peace and love and all this stuff. And there's this absolutely great story that I love that comes from Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, sunniest band around, right? So Dennis Wilson is driving along, he sees these two gorgeous young girls on the side of the road, he picks them up, of course, takes them back to his mansion, and they all corrals, and he starts telling them about his guru, the Masha, Maharishi, and how they should all learn TM. And one of the Manson girls says, well, we have our own guru. His name is Charlie Manson. Would you like to meet him? And Dennis Wilson said, yeah, of course I would. So they take him back to meet Charlie Wilson, to meet Charlie Manson, and Dennis loves him. He thinks he's great. They talk about music and composing. They write a song together, which Charlie called Cease to Exist. And the Beach Boys called it some, was it like Love Not to Love You or something? Something like that, but something different. So they're all high and together and friends and um, he decides to take Charlie Manson to Terry Melcher, who was living on Cielo Drive, who's a big record producer. He's the birds, right? Yeah. yeah. So he takes him to Terry. Terry hates him, hates the song, insults him. Manson threatens him. And Manson gets so mad, he threatens um, Dennis Wilson's kids by saying something like, isn't it lucky that your kids are safe at this minute? So both Dennis Wilson and Terry Melcher are freaked out. Um, Dennis Wilson doesn't want anything more to do with him. Terry Melcher moves out of his house on Cielo Drive and rents it to Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski. 
So although the rumor was that Manson sent his girls over there for Helter Skelter, it was really revenge. He was mad at Terry Meltzer, yeah. and that's what he did. Yeah. It was music. Mm -hmm. And later, uh, Terry Meltzer wrote Coke. <laughs> he did. He wrote Coke. Um, all right. So. Is the implication of the repetition of the mans and women in the text that in some way Lucy's bad decision making is like unto the bad decision making? Yeah. <coughs> it's the mans and girls were totally, most of them were young girls who had terrible family lives. They were kicked out of their homes. They were living on the streets. To them, Charlie Manson was a god. He told them, I love you, you're beautiful, you're this, you're that, you're going to be with me. And they would do anything for him. They felt he was God. And I think for Lucy, when she looked at them, instead of feeling, oh, that's the way I feel about William, she started feeling unnerved because she knew what these girls were capable of. And she started feeling, maybe it's not so good to be controlled like that. Maybe that's not what love really is. And the more she saw them, and the more anybody saw the men's and girls, the worse it was. Because they got crazier, and they said worse and worse things, like, you know, we're coming for you, we're killing all your children. Um, it was just a, a really weird and creepy and terrifying time. So is there a way that the book functions as a backhanded critique for those who would romanticize the counterculture theory? I think so, because, you know, I, when I, was, I mean, I remember a lot about the late 60s and the early 70s, but a lot of stuff I didn't remember. And so I talked to a lot of people, because a lot of people were saying, oh, cool, you know, loves to be soft, and bell bottoms, and make peace, not love, but, you know, the second year that I was at Brandeis, the year before I, I mean, the first year I was at Brandeis, the year before I got there, there were two 19-year-old girls, Catherine Sachs, I oh know, Susan Sachs and Catherine Powers, and they decided they were going to get guns and rob a bank for the revolution, and they did, and they killed a cop who was a father of nine, and they went underground for something like, I don't know, or years or whatever, and everybody at Brandeis was anxious. I mean, people got in their cars and drove up to Vermont and didn't come back to school for weeks. Nobody could believe it that these were upper class girls. Why were they doing this? And suddenly it changed everything. Now, Brandeis was a student strike center, and nobody wanted to do it anymore because they said it's not working. Peace is not working. Obviously, robbing a bank and killing somebody is not working. And everything started to sour and move down. And this whole attitude that things were cool, they, they weren't always cool. The drugs were harder. Um, I had a friend who shot up peanut butter in his veins. He thought that would be a really good idea. And it wasn't. Um, in the 60s, people took acid so they could see God. And in the 70s, they took acid so they could also take heroin. So there is sort of a, I mean, every era has its myths, but it wasn't, yeah, it really wasn't as wonderful as it was meant to be. Those certainly parts were a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, I wanted to ask one structural question, and I'm just trying to figure out how to do it without giving anything away. Oh. But let's say it's possible that a certain significant character in the novel <laughs> vanishes so right. in a way that most novel writers would consider incredibly tricky to pull off and come back from. There's one film where this happens by Alfred Hitchcock, where the main character is eliminated from the film rather early on. Right. And it's so fascinating how in that film a secondary protagonist is established to fill the spot. I was wondering how he thought about doing that. I assume that was a decision that was involved right from the outset. It was right from the, well, it, I, I knew that I wanted it to do it that way, but I didn't know I could pull it off. 
And then I sent it to my agent and she liked it. And then I sent it to my editor, Andra, and she said, that's a really gutsy thing to do. She said, I really like that. How are you going to pull that off? I don't know. <laughs> I guess I'll figure it out. And I had to really do a whole lot of work and a whole lot, a lot of rewrites to get it to work. And do you feel a sense of accomplishment having done something so difficult? You know, this is like what we were talking about backstage. I look at it as I wrote this book. It took three or four years of my life. It was the hardest thing I ever did. <clears throat> And now it's done, and now I want to think about my new book. <laughs> it's sort of, I've already moved on to these other people and these other problems. And um, that's sort of what I want to try to figure out. It's the figuring out that interests me. And then once I've written it, I just hope that you know, the characters know that come alive and find me and be mad at me for what I did to them. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, aren't you the same way? Don't you? I mean, I had a similar experience when I wrote The Ice Storm. There's a kid who dies in the ice storm, right? And it was tricky for me because at that time it was only my second novel. I had never killed a character before. And so it was really emotional um, uh, and moving. And I think actually important for my career, you know, when I did it. But I didn't really think about it much until they went to make the movie. Right. And I remember Ang Lee told me that they they went into the to Fox because that was the studio, and they and he said, "Okay, I want to do this book." And the first words out of the studio head were, "You can't kill the kid." And Ang Lee said, "But that's what it's about. We have to kill the kid." No, okay. And you know. So for months afterwards, the studio tried to get them to water down the script and not do it. Did you like working with Hollywood? I have so many bad Hollywood stories. Oh, we could have a whole second reading. I know. Yeah. I know. It's it's uh, has an effort. The road to hell is paved with adaptations. <laughs> yeah, they change everything. They change everything, and then it never turns out the same book. And so you have to really just sort of say, okay, you want to change the character into a telephone operator in the 30? Go ahead. <laughs> and you just hope that it'll, it'll lead people to the book. But that movie, The Ice Tone, was really good. Yeah, it's really good. I still remember Sigourney Weaver with a Yep. Yeah. <laughs> in the garden. Should we let them ask some questions? Okay. Go for it. Uh, oh, okay. I was really interested what drew you into the 60s and 70s again. I mean, I know that that's my era, so I'm, I'm always trying to re examine it and always go, okay. But what made you say, oh, that era? Wait, don't answer yet. I'm supposed to restate the question. Oh, yes. He's going to restate the question. Thank you. So the question is. How, what drew Caroline into the era of the 60s and 70s? Um, because, because I remember, I, mean, I was young in the 60s and in college in the 70s, and I remember that was the first time I ever felt a really radical demarcation from what it was like to be in the 70s and, you know, go on peace marches with my sister and everything was peace and love and make love not more. And we, and we really believed we were going to change the world in this profound and lasting way. And then all of a sudden the 70s hit and everything we had tried to do failed. The war didn't go away, it escalated. Mm -hmm. All the peace groups didn't have any manifest, and there was the weathermen, and they were blowing up buildings. Right. The whole drug culture was no longer a way to build community, it was people were dying. Mm -hmm. People were dying, and all the people, I mean, the song, the quintessential song in the 1960s that I got from Jeff was, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair because you'll meet some gentle people there and they'll be Lovins. And that was the late 60s. I went to Begins and Lovins, and then suddenly in the 70s, it was Altamont. 
and people stopped hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling, oh, this is really too bad. It was so, and you couldn't be as wild anymore. <laughs> and it just seemed like this, you went from a beautiful world to one that was much more dangerous and much crueler. And it was, well, what do you do with that hope? Mm -hmm. What do you do with that hope? I mean, mm -hmm. you can continue right now. I saw a lot of people who, they didn't, they just, went back to school and they said, okay, forget it. I'm not going to work for social change. I'm going to be a, a banker or whatever to have a steady job. And it was a, it was a sad time. And I was actually thinking about it during this election because our son became, he's 20, and he became very, very interested in Bernie Sanders and looking for him. He had that same kind of idealistic hope that Bernie was going to win. He was going to save us all. And Jeff and I didn't want to bust his bubble because we remembered in the 60s, you know, going clean for Gene and trying to vote for McGovern, and none of them won. It was the status quo always won. But it was kind of nice for a while to see that fever that he had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Thank you. But it sense it's where does the hope go? That is, that's perfect. Yeah, where does it's it go? Write it down. <laughs> I'm Leslie Gaten, by the way. Um, can I get away with a kind of student question? Sure. And since you, all right, so you mentioned that you're writing Third Person Limited, and I have an album in progress, and a writer whom I believe you probably both know suggested that I take this novel, which you seem to like, and rewrite it in Third Person Limited. But because doing anything new is difficult, I'm very tempted to keep some chapters in first person. And I wanted to know if I were your student, either of you, what would you say if I was resisting and I was like, can I write some first, keep some chapters in first person and some in third person limited? Oh, this is going to be really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I have to restate the question. No. <laughs> I don't know if I can restate that one. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody ever pulled off keeping some chapters in third person limited and some in first? I know one really good example. Excellent. Do you mind if I just jump? Please. Up? Underworld by Don DeLillo. So you should go read Underworld. Underworld. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to tackle that? Um, I might personal feeling about it. It's really hard to tell how a story should be told. And a lot of times when I start a story, I'll start it in present tense and then move it in past tense. And then I'll be like, well, why did I do that? <laughs> should I keep it in the same tense? Um, sometimes some things call for first person if you want something really intimate. Right. But the beauty of being a writer is you don't have to keep a whole novel in first person. You can keep you can do one chapter in first person and do another in third person. It's I think the rules are there are no rules as long as it works and it feels real. So my advice to you would be just sort of listen to yourself when you're reading your pages over and see if they make sense and if they're if they feel alive for you. Okay, neither one of you yelled at me and said, no, that's too ambitious, shut up. So that's good. Thank you very much. <laughs> That'll be $500. Yes, I'm sure it would be. It's never too ambitious. Anyone else? One more. Time for one more. All right, I'll ask you one. Okay. What are you reading now? What are you excited about? We are in the Center for Fiction. Give us some tips. Oh, I read this great book called Shelter in Place by Alexander Mixick. Yeah, it's dark, gritty, moving. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Um, I have, and I want all my writer friends who are in the audience to know that the reason why I chose this book is because it would take me like 10 minutes to mention all of your work, but I have a lot of, you know, there's Leora Sculpin Smith, a brilliant novelist. Susan Henderson is just amazing, amazing. Jessica Blau's books are great. Um, I can't see past the third book. <laughs> <laughs> but who else is in here is also too. But um, I also recommend that everybody read this book, Eileen. I think it's up for the Booker Prize. It's really, it's like everything you're told not to do. An unlikable protagonist, but you still can't take your eyes away from her. Um, just kind of a 
really downer spiral, but it's <laughs> What are you reading? Well, I was reading, I was reading your book. <laughs> but I'm also reading, well, I'm going to, in the spring, I'm going to teach a lit class in contemporary fiction from Africa. Oh. So I've been reading tons of African writers, which has been so thrilling. It's such an exciting journey. Oh, that's great. I've discovered, you know, many exciting, really compelling novels that I wasn't like, aware of. Like who? It's a long list. Okay, let's send me the list. Um, and I'm also reading Canal Scarred's My Struggle I'm in Volume 3. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty great. Well. Thank you all so much. Thank you.